In this video, we'll analyze the denoising capabilities of Nikon's advanced NIS software. First, we'll be explaining the theoretical foundation of denoising and introduce the methodology for evaluating image quality. We will also explore the diverse type of noise commonly encountered in imaging. Next, we will assess the adaptability of the software across various types and quantities of noise using synthesized images. Finally, we'll enhance authentic images and demonstrate its practical utility in improving image clarity and detail. Image quality evaluation refers to the process of examining the fidelity, clarity, and perceptual accuracy of images. In our context, we use this to measure the effectiveness of denoising. Generally, three key metrics are employed to evaluate image quality. The first one is peak signal to noise ratio or PSNR. It measures the ratio between the maximum possible power of a signal, so in this case it's the maximum value of a pixel, and the power of corrupting noise that affects the fidelity of its representation. The larger the PSNR, the more digitally similar the images are. The problem with this metric is that it relies strictly on numerical comparison and it does not actually take into account biological factors of the human visual system. So we won't be using this metric. SSIM, on the other hand, assesses not only the structural similarity, but also the luminance similarity between two images. By considering human visual perception, it gives a more comprehensive measure of similarity. SSIM is calculating using this formula, and it gives results between 0 and 1, where 0 indicates dissimilar images, and 1 represents identical images. The last metric is the NCC. It measures the similarity between two signals or two images by computing the normalized cross-correlation coefficient, which indicates how much one signal resembles another, taking into account differences in mean and standard deviation. It can be calculated using this formula, and the results of the normalized cross-correlation are within the interval minus 1, 1, where 1 indicates a perfect correlation, 0 indicates no correlation, and minus 1 indicates that the images are inverted relative to each other. In the next part, we are going to use images where we intentionally added noise on, and we're going to use three types of noise. The first noise is a multiplicative Gaussian noise. It is obtained by multiplying each pixel by a random value that follows a Gaussian probability distribution of this form. Multiplicative noise is a common phenomenon in many coherent imaging systems, such as lasers. It can result from various sources, including laser power fluctuations or uh, optical imperfections in the beam propagation path. We will also be using additive Gaussian noise. It's obtained by adding each pixel by a random value that follows a Gaussian probability distribution, the same as the multiplicative Gaussian noise. One of the most common sources of additive Gaussian noise is thermal noise. It's generated by the thermal agitation of charge carriers within a conductor. The last noise is salt and pepper noise, also known as impulse noise. It appears in the form of white pixels, so salt, or black pixels, pepper, within an image. And uh, mathematically, it can be modeled by a function that randomly replaces certain pixels in the image with extreme grayscale values, so black or white. This noise can result from malfunctions or the presence of fine particles on the elements of the camera sensor, or data transmission errors, or the presence of defective memory locations in the hardware. In this section, we want to determine whether training the software on one type of noise enables the denoising of images affected by a different type of noise. So in the first place, we trained the software on these two training images. We started by training the software on images that had a multiplicative Gaussian noise. Then we applied this training on images that had additive and salt and pepper noise. So these are the denoised images that we got. And so to compare the denoised images with the original images, we calculated the SIM and the NCC. And these are the results that we found. 
we can notice that for the two images and the two noises, the SCM values are correct, but the NCCs are quite low and they are even inverted for the images with the additive noise. Then we train the software on images with additive Gaussian noise and we applied it to images with multiplicative and salt and pepper noise. And here are the results that we found for the SM and the NCC. So we can see that uh, for the multiplicative noise, the metrics are good. It's probably because the, this noise follows the same distribution as the additive noise that we trained the software on. For the salt and pepper noise, the denoising is very poor. We can see it by just looking at the pictures, but the quality metrics confirm it too. It could be explained by the fact that salt and pepper noise is random, unlike Gaussian noise, which follows a precise function. And so the machine denoises according to the learned function, but does not know how to denoise a random noise. Finally, we trained the software on salt and pepper noise, and we applied it to multiplicative and additive noise. Here are the results. Overall, these results are the best. The smallest value is 0.46, which is higher than what we had for the previous trainings. And the values are similar for the two types of noise. And so we could say that by training the machine on salt and pepper noise, which is a noise that is distributed randomly, we can denoise any kind of noise. Another important parameter to take into account when denoising an image is the quantity of noise. So we studied the ability of the software to denoise images depending on noise coefficients. We did it for the three different types of noises. For the first image, these are the results that we got. We plotted the quality metrics depending on the quantity of noise. Looking at the NCC, we see that for both additive and salt and pepper noise, for a quantity of noise bigger than 0.6, the denoising is not efficient anymore. For the second image, the curves have the same shape as the first one. For the NCC, there is also some sort of threshold value for a quantity of noise around 0.6 for both additive and salt and pepper noise. Now for the last part, we are going to use real images, especially those captured using a confocal microscope. Our goal is to accelerate image acquisition using shorter dwell times. But using shorter dwell times frequently introduces unwanted noise into the images. So to address this issue, we intend to denoise the images after they were captured. And to evaluate the efficiency of this approach, we will compute the quality metrics. So these three images are uh, references. They were taken with the longest dwell time, which is 16 microseconds. And ideally, this is what we would want to get by uh, denoising images taken with smallest dwell times. So there are three types of images, three different proteins. The first one, M-cherry, represents the cell of the plant. The second one, GFP, or green fluorescent protein, marks the mitochondria. And the last one, Psi5, represents the chloroplasts of the plant. We took images at two different parts of the plant to have two examples to try the denoising on. The first part is called ERG, and the second part is MRAG. So we acquired images with different dwell times, and then we denoised them. We plotted the evolution of the NCC depending on the dwell time for different fluorophores in different parts of the plant. So we can see that apart from the m cherry protein in MRAG, the NCC for the denoised images is always higher than the one for the noisy images, which is a good start. For the M-cherry in ERG, this method is pretty efficient because we see that for the denoised image taken using the dwell time of 0.16 microseconds, we have a better NCC than for the original image taken with an 8 microsecond dwell time. So in this case, when using this method, we can use a dwell time of 0.16 microseconds and still get a better result than if we had used a dwell time 50 times bigger and not denoise the image. It's also the case for MRAG Sci-5. But for the ERG Sci-5 zone, it's not as efficient. It could be helpful when reducing the dwell time from 1 microsecond to 0.6 microsecond, but it's probably not worth it since uh, the time difference is very small.
as a conclusion, this technique could be used to significantly reduce acquisition times, as we saw with Ergen Cherry and MRAG Sci-5, where the acquisition time could be reduced by 30. But for the other zones like Erg Sci-5 and MRAG and Cherry, maybe we would need to do more research to try and understand why it doesn't work in that case.